And so this message tonight is, is what I would call a word of faith message, and it's faith over feelings. How many know that when you're believing God's word, you believe because it's what the word says? Your feelings will tell you a different story oftentimes, <laughs> or your thoughts. And so as, as a uh, mature Christian, and as you learn to walk in faith, you learn to stand on the word. And you learn to come to this place in your life. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Even though circumstances say something else. God's word changes circumstances. Circumstances can never change the truth of God's word. God's word is forever settled in heaven, the Bible says. It's already been declared. So we hang on to that word. We get it into our spirit, and then we get it coming out of our mouth, and we just soak in the word. If you really, really want to just continue to develop your faith, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Just become a, a word lover. Just get that word in your morning, afternoon, and evening. And, and when you pray, stop asking God so much for things over and over again if you do that. Once you ask him once, that's all you got to do. Then you praise him for it. Amen. Amen. And then you declare. You make declarations. You say, God, I thank you that you heard me. I thank you that you're moving on behalf of my prayer. And I thank you that you will manifest it in my life. If it lines up with the word of God, you can take it to the bank. It's coming. Your answer is coming. But you've got to hang in there. And you've got to not be swayed. Because if you, if you let negative thoughts rule you, the first thing your negative thoughts will take a hold of is your tongue. And death and life are in the power of the tongue. If you start speaking wrong then you're going to um, be on the wrong track. And so, word of faith and believe in God is all about controlling our words and um, speaking God's word. Smith Wigglesworth said this. He's, he, of course, he was a, if you don't know who he was, he was a wonderful minister. Um, I think documented something like 19 people raised from the dead. I mean, powerful man of God. But he didn't get that way um, just overnight, just walking down the street and the power of God hit him. That man spent pr time in the presence of God. That man sought God and wanted God and wanted more of God. Doesn't the Bible say draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you? Does the Bible say desire spiritual gifts and, and desire that you, would, that, um, you could walk in love and, and benefit people? You have that kind of heart. Who knows what God has for you? But a tremendous man of faith, he said this, he says, I can't understand God by feelings. I can't understand the Lord Christ by feelings. I can only understand God the Father and Jesus Christ by what the Word says about them. God is everything the Word says He is. We need to get acquainted with Him through the Word. If you want to know what a lot of Christians' problems are, they're, they're trying to get to know God through their feelings. Your feelings will lie to you. You understand God. You get to know him. God and his word are one. And so the more you read the word and the more you get it into your spirit, the more you'll, you'll come to walk in the light of what already belongs to you. If you're born again, you're already one, one spirit with the Lord. You're already a child of God. You've already been cleansed from your sins. You've already... Uh, been, God has put gifts and abilities in you. You already have the spiritual DNA to live by faith because God said the just shall live by faith. He'd be an unjust God if he said that and you couldn't do it. You can do it. But the thing is, we have to understand and learn that it's the word of God that we live by. Brother Hagen would say all the time, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. So, too many people try to get acquainted with God through their feelings. How many know that, um, how many know some people like that? They're, they're born again, and they, they, know, they have a relationship with the Lord, of course, because they're children of God, but that's as far as it went. Then they walk in, their mind is, is darkened. When they feel good, they think that God heard their prayer. When they don't feel particularly good, they think he has not heard them. Their faith is based on their feelings, whereas it should be based on what? God's word. You've got to base your faith on God's word. 
How many of you have prayed and, and in your mind you struggled with negative thoughts or feelings in your emotion, but, but you hung in there and you believe what the Word said? What do, you, what do you need to do if, if you're in that battle? Keep renewing that mind. The Word of God, the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What, what part of you gets transformed? Your spirit's already been born again, a new creation. That's good to go. The old noggin, right? Got to clear out the stinking thinking and get in the fresh Word of God. You can tell if someone's thinking wrong because it'll, it'll come out. Amen? And then it's up to us, as spiritual leaders, to, to let them know, okay, you need, you know, here's, here's what the Word says, and now let's, let's meditate on the Word. Meditation brings revelation. Meditate on that Word and get it, get it going, and then start speaking it. Be it, like Sister Sedona said, not just be a hearer of the Word, but be a doer of the Word. Hear the Word, do the Word. And it's in, the, it's in the doing of the word that you do it in the midst of the storm and the battles and all these things. It's not easy because the Bible says it's to fight. Fight the fight of faith. But it is possible and it is very rewarding. It's not easy because our natural minds are powerful. Am I the only one? And our emotions and our feelings, we got to pray, Lord, save me from myself. You know, sometimes we're our own worst enemies. But you can get better at it. You can grow stronger at it because the Bible says Abram grew stronger in faith. Did he not? He didn't consider his body now dead or 100 years old nor the deadness of Sarah's womb, but he, he considered God faithful to one who promised. He grew stronger in faith, and we can too. But we have to put our minds to it. But life will hit you hard. We live in a planet with the curse on it. But what's the next part? We serve a risen Savior. You know, I remember uh, when I worked at the tree service in the beginning, um, you know, we just had, we had guys working, and sometimes some of the guys working just really didn't want to be there and whatever, and they, they were tough to work with. But then they started hiring people out of college, people that were going to school for, to be arborists. And those guys were like a different, cut from a different cloth. They wanted to be there. But some of them knew just enough to be dangerous, though. They had all the book work, and they had the head knowledge. And, you know, at school, you might have, they might have started to saw up. And they climbed up Mont Alto, one of the campuses, these nice big, nice trees. They threw a little rope up and pulled up and went up 100 foot and come down. And I'm a, I'm a tree trimmer. No, you're not. You went up a tree and came down. <laughs> and then when they would get out on a job, that's when you could tell if they had it in them or not. Because when you're taking down a 100-foot tree over a million-dollar home and it's stone dead and you're roping every piece and the chipper sounds like a war zone and, brand, and big logs are coming down and exploding and, and people are yelling. And depending what kind of foreman you have, <laughs> you know, it's just like all over the place. You got They have to dig down deep and say, okay, uh, I got a lot of learning to do. But that's the way life is. You're going to hear a good, wonderful word of faith message, but I guarantee you tomorrow there'll be a battle to overcome. There'll be a challenge. But the first step in overcoming those battles is don't be moved by what you see or feel. If you're believing God for something, believe the word. Stand on the word of God. God's word will change those circumstances. So some people, they'll say, well, I prayed and I felt pretty good about it. Well, so what? What's feelings have to do with it? Well, I prayed and uh, I felt like God didn't hear me. You got to get out of those feelings. Get out of your feelings, right? Look at John chapter 20, and we'll start with verse 19. This is when Jesus appears to the disciples. And um, doubting Thomas, this is where this, this comes from, and he was one who based his faith on his feelings. He relied on what he could see and touch and not on what God had to say. And so we can learn from him. But I want to show you something interesting about this account in the Word of God. This is when Jesus, I mean, he just rose from the dead. And he just appears on the scene. I mean, this is powerful. 
They just watched him hang on a cross. They just watched him get a spear stuck in his side and, and blood and water gush out. They just watched him being nailed and, 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 and hanging there and getting beaten. You know, the, the, there's a scripture in the Bible that says that Jesus was literally unrecognizable as a man, as a human. We've all pretty much probably have seen the passion of Christ. You know, that was a pretty graphic detail, but that was nothing compared to really what happened to him. And they just watched that gruesomeness. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes on the scene. And they were excited to see him. So look at John chapter 20, verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's where the church began. Amen. Receive you the Holy Spirit. Or I believe it could have said, be born again in the Spirit. Look at verse 23. If you, this is powerful. I'm not teaching on this tonight, but you can, this is powerful. He says, if you forgive anyone's sin, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them, and the doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing amongst them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. But blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Amen. Now, I found something interesting. You know, when Jesus appeared to the, first appeared to the other disciples, he did the same thing that he did with Thomas. He showed them his scars, did he not? L look at this. So Thomas wasn't the only one. But there's a slight difference. Look at verse 20. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. And they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And so these disciples saw Jesus appeared. And so they did believe uh, uh, in, in a lot of ways with their physical senses, right? They could see. Now they had the faith of God too, but they, they had the physical aid, right? They could see him. But what the difference is, is that when Thomas, when, when they gave Thomas the word, Thomas didn't believe the word. And that's how it's going to be done. That's how it is done, right? Go out and preach the gospel. Those who believe will be saved. Those who don't, won't. And so they, they spoke the word, the anointed word, and Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it. That's a dangerous place to be. Amen? And so... In verse 28, he says, my Lord, my God, Thomas exclaimed, and Jesus, verse 29, then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. He didn't say that it was, he's like, okay, you believe because you see me. He said, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. In other words, this is how it's going to be. Not everybody, very few people are going to have Jesus appear in the same room, Amen. right? When they speak the word, the Holy Spirit will reveal the Lord and Savior himself. The Holy Spirit, when you tell someone about Jesus, the Holy Spirit will be there. Amen. To usher that word into the hearts of the people. It's up to them whether or not they want to receive it or reject it. 
But Jesus was saying there's, there's, there's coming a, a new way where there will be a blessed people. We're in that group. In this new and living way, we all heard about Jesus and we believe with all of our heart. We believe in a Lord that raised from the dead and we've never seen him. A lot of us, most of us, I haven't really ever, I've never seen him with my physical eyes. But he's more real to me than anything physical. Because the presence of the Holy Spirit lives in me and he bears witness with me. We have the presence of God in us. And Jesus said, you're blessed when you're in that position. We believe the word, right? Romans 10, 17, faith continues to develop in you as you continue to hear the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God is anointed. It is sent by God. It's faith food or faith seed or scriptural faith equals spiritual faith. Your belief, spiritual faith is believing the, the scripture. Believe in what God said. There's power in that. And so he's saying there's coming a day. But when I was reading that today, it just, it just dawned on me. He showed them the same scars. Did he not? Showed them the exact same scars. But going through the history of the church, very few people were in that setting. They believed by the power of the word. That's how you believe God for healing, by the way. It's the same way you got born again. It's the same way. You, it's all of the spirit. You believe it in the spirit. The, the healing comes out of your spirit into the rest of your, into the rest of your body. You got to keep feeding your spirit and believe in God for it. I remember uh, the Lord told Brother Hagin, Brother Hagin had a lot of visions of the Lord. I mean, powerful visions. Sitting there talking, standing there talking to him. He just appeared on, appeared on the scene. The last time the Lord came, the Lord said, he said, Ken, I'm not going to appear to you like this anymore. He said, from now on, I'm going to relate to you and, and um, uh, uh, come to you like I do everyone else through the word and the spirit. And what the Lord told him was, is if I keep coming to you in this way, it's going to hurt your faith. Amen. There's a lot of people out there looking for the vision. What do you need the vision for? Get the vision in here. Amen. Start seeing things with the eyes of faith. My body tells me I'm not well. The body tells me this. Well, the, the body is a physical circumstance. What's the word of God say? What are you willing to believe God for? That's how people's lives change. Look at uh, 1 John 5, verse 13. So oftentimes in our life, as you turn over there, we believe things off of the physical senses. You know, that's, that's, we're physical, we're just as much physical as we are spiritual, right? But the, but, but, but the spirit of God in us and the born again spiritual man or the spiritual woman is to dominate the natural person, right? That's why the Bible says, take off the old man, put on the new. Be, be, uh, be at the peace walking in the power of God. How many times did Jesus say, peace be with you? We, we are to have way more peace than what a lot of people are experiencing. Amen. Even in these troubled times. You know, the Bible says that all these things are going to happen in the end of the world, but it also says the gospel is going to be preached. That's an end time sign. A lot of times people want to talk about all the other ones. Well, okay, yeah. The gospel will be preached to all the earth. Let's be in that number. Jesus said, when I come back, we'll I find faith. What's he saying? Well, I find people that are not moved by what they see or feel or not contaminated by the world and their thinking and their action. Well, I find people that are dedicated to the, to the things of God. He'll find those people here. Amen. And many other places too. But look at 1 John 5, 13. It says, These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you believe on the name of the Son of God? Do you believe you have eternal life? That's faith. Amen. 
That's supernatural faith that came to you when someone brought you the word. That's what I'm saying. When you go out there to tell people, don't go by their faces and don't go by their circles. Don't ever, if, don't even wait till you feel led. Just start telling everybody. Just start telling everybody. If you want to know if it's God's will or not, yeah, it's his will. 2,000 years ago, he said the harvest was ready. I'll never forget when Gary Eisler was in the hospital and um, his sister called dad and, and I just became the pastor and dad said, well, you go because I want him to get to know you as a pastor. So I went out there and I, I was like, I was the first person I ever visited in the hospital in that capacity. And I, I walked in there, you know, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I never met Gary in my life. And so I walk in there and there's a man sitting on the side of the bed. What I didn't know is that that night he, he pulled out the Bible and he started reading the Bible and he was searching the scriptures. He was like the eunuch in the chariot. Remember that when Philip came up on the chariot? He's like, I don't understand. And, and I sat down beside, beside Gary and honestly, the anointing just took over. And started talking to him about the Lord and he said he wanted to get saved. He got saved. And I mean to tell you, he set the machines off. He literally, he was all plugged up and the nurse come running in and where he's like, it's okay, I just got saved. And then I said, there's more. I mean, I was feeling it in the spiritual way. I mean, I was like, I said, okay, well, if the Lord can save him, why can't the Lord heal him? And he had, he had these stomach issues that were really plaguing him and he got healed of that. And here he is today. Still in the church, still serving God, helping out in the school every day. I came over to the church this afternoon. We had a neighbor across the road wanted to get married. Never met him before in his life. So we talked to him and his now wife. And, and uh, um, you never know what you're going to get into as a pastor. And uh, they're saved. They're born again. And, and, uh, but Gary's sitting out there on the bench reading his Bible. And he says, Man, I just can't get enough of the Holy Spirit. He said, man, the Holy Spirit, you know how Gary talks. Man, the Holy Spirit will talk to you if you talk to him. The Holy Spirit will be there for you. All you got to do is reach out to him. And he's like, who got him to that place? This is like 20 years ago, 19, 20 years ago. Who got him to that place? The Spirit of God within him. Amen. He kept coming. He kept learning. He kept growing. He he. He started, he learned how to walk in the light of what he got that day in the hospital. That's what it's all about, right? We walk in the light of the word of God and who we are in Christ. And you do that on purpose. And he really blessed my heart. You know, and you see him, and he, he wears this 30 odd six empty shell around his neck. Because that's the bullet that he tried to take his life with. And the gun didn't go off. And this is right before, this, then he ended up in the hospital when I went to see him. And um, he went home then and shot that rifle and, it, and its shell went off that time. And he wears it around his neck. To me, that's what Christian living is all about. Isn't it? But the good thing about it is he didn't have happened what happened to him because it was me there. Anybody could have walked in there that was willing. Amen? Anybody could have walked in there, because that's what I did. I mean, I was, uh, for lack of a better word, I, I was scared. Or I was like a little timid, like, I don't know this guy. I'm going to walk in there. And... Uh, but I did it because I felt compelled by the Spirit of God. I felt if God changed my life, why can't he change this man's life? Amen. The, the less of you that you put into it, the better you are. You're going to get in the way sometimes. Yes. Or am I the only one? But when I walked out of that hospital room, I was like, I don't even know if I was walking on the actual floor. I felt like I was floating <laughs> on a cloud. You tell me why Christians couldn't have the joy of the Lord and the fulfillment if they just would just do what God said. 
You know why you have a lot of unhappy Christians? Because they don't want to yield to the Spirit of God. They won't, don't want to yield to the Word of God. They still want to be carnal and natural too. They still haven't got it in them yet that the world has nothing for them, so they live half in, half out. And that makes one miserable. If you want the true joy and the true peace and the true love of God coming out of your life, that comes from sowing to the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, sow to the Spirit. Walk in the light of who you are. And then start winning some battles. You know, we were just talking about when we built this, this gymnasium fellowship center. I tried to get that built when I first got here. It wasn't the right time, but I had it in my heart. And we had a media, uh, uh, a uh, Christmas dinner here. And at that time, we had it in here. I had it all planned out. Everybody was eating, and um, I thought, well, at the end, I'll cast the vision for the building. Never wait to the end. <laughs> I think Dad's told me that one or two times. Because <laughs> when everybody was fed and, and feeling good, and, and I waited all evening, and, and, I, and I said, you know, this is what the Lord put in my heart to do. And I looked out, and there was a lot of people were talking to each other. They weren't even listening to me. And, and, and then I just started talking. Then some of them were getting up and just walking out. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to cast a vision here. I'm like, rah, rah. I felt like the one that they play a trick on in football where everybody in the team says, okay, well, we're not going to run out, but they, he don't know that, right? You ever see him do that? And he runs out on the field like It wasn't the people's fault. It was my fault. I, I, I was still learning to hear the Lord, still learning to be sensitive to the whole. They're, they're the sheep. They're the object of God's love. It's my job to, to um, nurture them to the place. It, it wasn't the right time. And then when the Lord put it in our heart again, this time things started to fall into place. And um, we were just talking about it. Sister Ruth, her name is on that building for a reason. Not only was she a faithful servant of God, but when, when the Lord called us to do this building, I mean, it was strong. Then you start talking about it, and then you get the negativity. Well, engineers, that will probably cost you about $12,000 just to do this or that. And then you got, I mean, it was like depressing. Because we might have had like $5,000 in the building fund. And then, you know, you got to get the, the township. And then you got, I mean, it's like all oh, this, these numbers. And Sister Ruth, I can tell you about now because she's in heaven. She had this stock, these stocks that she was transferring over. And she had a stock, stocks worth $40,000. And she signed it over to the church. It was the right timing, the right place, the right just anointing on it. And she said, she said, I want that building built. I want it built for the glory of God. When she put that money in there, that was all the money. It took every bit of that money to get all through the engineers and to get through all that red tape. It took about $40,000 just to get started. In the Slate parking lot, that was in on that. I mean, but now we're, we're moving up and we're moving out because we have such a desire and, and a craving to, to glorify God. And we want to we wanna help these children. And we want to help these parents. Sister and I is in there with like, what, 13, 14 little kindergartners? And, and, and some of them, I mean, it's, it's a challenging job in there. Some of these the little ones, they, they don't know any structure. And that means they don't sit still, <laughs> in case you're wondering. That means they, they don't follow instructions. That means they end up in Pastor Dane's office. That means they have Leslie talking to them, too. And, uh, but, but she's fighting for these kids. Amen? Anytime anyone helps or gives or does anything, we do it for God, ultimately. But we know that the target is the children. 
And if we get these children, we're going to get the families. Amen? We're going to get these families. It's hard being a single mother out there. We've got a lot of single mothers. It's hard. It's hard being a single father. And, and these kids come in a different kind of a lot of emotions and a lot of things going on in their life. And when, the, when they come, the first thing they get is chapel. And the other day, Monday, I came into the chapel, and, and Pastor Dane had music going on, and he, uh, nice, nice music. Uh, and uh, honestly, it felt like I was walking back in the Rama again. It felt like I was just walking right into an anointing. It felt like that here, too. Amen? But, but I walked in a gym, and I knew, I know the presence of God. Trust me. Not that you don't go by feelings always, but, but you can tangibly feel it. And when I, when I, just, I just knew I was in the presence of God. And I knew those kids would be too. Well, when you step out in faith, it's, it's, it's a battle. It costs you something. Amen? But now it's sort of like, we just want to keep going. God will provide. We don't see the need to stop. Or to slow down. But do you believe in the name of the Son of God? Then you should know that you have eternal life. How do you know? The faith within your spirit. Amen. That's where the word is. That's where the spirit of God is. And look at verse um, 14. Having said verse 13. Verse 14 says. And. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will. Well, what's his will? What, what is the will of God or the will of the Lord? The word is God's will. Amen. If we ask, does it say anything? Anything according to his will. So can I pray that the neighbor's cars would get blown out because he, he drives too fast down? His wheels would get blown, tires get blown out because he drives too fast down the road? It's not according to God's will. Can I pray for healing? Can I pray for deliverance? Can I pray for peace of mind? Can I pray for my marriage? Can I pray for my children? Can I pray for um, just uh, finances? You better believe you can. We're supposed to have confidence when we do it. This is the confidence. Jesus is our confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. How many times have you prayed and it felt like he wasn't hearing you? Be honest. You're honest anyway. I'll answer that thousands of times for me. So what do I do? I know I I, I know that he is, and I stand on the fact that, I, God, I say it. God, I know you're hearing me. I know you heard me, because your word says you hear me. You can renew your mind that way. Amen. Right? Look at verse 15. It gets better. And if we know that he hears us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. If you're struggling in that area and in your prayers, you, you can go to that scripture and you can just settle it in your mind. God, I know that you hear me. First of all, God, I know that I, I believe in the name of your son. And I know that I have eternal life. And I have confidence that when I pray, you hear me. And when I pray according to your word, according to your will, I can have what I pray for because of who Jesus is. That's faith. It's awful hard if you try to live that life and then go talk to the negative people. There's some people in your life that you, that you shouldn't share this part of your life with if they don't understand and don't believe it. Right? Not that you, but you talk to them about anything else, but you got to watch the negativity and watch people speaking doubt and unbelief into your life. Brother Hagen said this. He said, one day I prayed for a woman three times that she'd be healed. 
Each time she said, I haven't got it yet. Pray again. <laughs> and Brother Hagen finally said, when are you going to start believing that you're healed? Well, she said, when I get healed. <laughs> and he said, what in the world would you want to believe for it then? Why would you want to believe for it then? It seems like you would, you would know it then. <laughs> Sometimes we can slip over into that, can't we? So God, when, when it comes to spiritual healing, God's healing is a, is a spiritual healing, is it not? If medical science heals, which is, is a gift from God too, but if medical science heals, it heals through the physical, right? It heals through the physical, but not to say God doesn't have a hand and guides that physical process. I believe 100% he does, but natural science heals through the physical. God heals through the spirit, the spirit of the man or the spirit of the woman. That's where the kingdom of God is within you. The word and the spirit, that's the part that's to rise up. That's why Smith Wigglesworth said, I'm, I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. He didn't get that way thinking about his feelings. Faith has no feelings, does it? But when God heals, he heals through the spirit. Spiritual healing or divine healing is received from God the same way that the new birth happens. Which the rebirth or the new birth of the spirit, it happens within your inner man, does it not? Look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. So, so what I want you to get here is that, yeah, you have a natural part of you. You have a natural mind, a physical mind. Much of what you do is in the natural, seeing and looking. And, and you know, if you look out there and your grass is this high, two feet high, your natural reasoning will say, I need to cut my grass. Because you're looking at it, right? <laughs> and, you're, and so it's the physical. But we're talking about the spiritual. We're talking about the wonderful world of, of God's word, finding home in your heart and allowing you to see with the eyes of faith. That means you call things that are not as though they were. That means you don't speak the problem, you speak the promise, you speak the word into it and believe that that word will change those circumstances. We got plenty of scripture that backs it up. I know there's a lot of churches, they don't like this kind of message. But you know what? They don't have any scripture to back it up if they don't like it. All they got is tradition. You know what they got? Well, God will heal you if he wants to. But that's about as wishy-washy as you can get. Because he, he's already said he wants to. He's already done it 2,000 years ago. By his stripes you were healed. Healing was in the redemptive work. It belongs to you. It's a lot easier to believe God for something that belongs to you than to feel like you're asking God for something that he may or may not. Oh, trust me, he wants you well. He's provided it for you. Healing was in the old covenant for the Israelites, was it not? Jesus said in the old covenant said healing is the bread of the children of Israel. Well, healing is our bread too. By his stripes we were healed. 2,000 years ago. So when you pray and you're believing, you, you know you have a covenant right to it. It's what the Word of God tells you. And you hold on to it and you say, God, I believe you and I'm making declarations and I'm praising you and I'm thanking you for it. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, are you in Christ? Then you're a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So when you are born again, it's not your body that's born again. You still have the same body that you always had. The new birth doesn't change the physical in any way. After you are saved and born again, it is the inner man now that's to dominate the physical man. We've led a lot of people to Christ, lots of them. And if they're five foot ten, two hundred pounds, and we lead them to the Lord, guess what? 
They're five foot ten, two hundred pounds. All the fireworks happened in there, inside. Some people jump up and down and hug you and run all over the place, and some people show no emotion. They're like, thank you. But it's there. So you can't be moved by that. Some people are just more emotional than others. But it's with the inner man, the born again man, the new created man with the spirit of God in it, with the word of God in it. It's what changes these natural circumstances all day long. Brother Hagen would, would do that masterfully with building Ramah. Ramah has a big budget. And, and, but you've got to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit now, too, and follow the leading of, of, of his voice. Follow the peace of God inside. And sometimes they'd want to get him to move on these important decisions, and he would say, I don't care how much you pressure me. I'm not moving till I know God tells me what to do. I'm not moving. I'm not making a decision because you're pressuring me. Pressure is never from the Lord. Self-doubt is never from the Lord. Comparing yourself to anyone else is never from the Lord. It's all feelings. It's all natural. Faith has no feelings. Faith learns to listen to the still, small voice within you. And Brother Hagin would hear the, the voice of the Lord, and he would, he would say, go, or stay, or yes, or no, or this, or that. But he would not move until he knew that God was telling him to move. So the new birth is in the human spirit. Look at John 3, 6. So we're talking about living by faith and living by the word, but you got to know who you are in, in the spiritual world. Do you think that you're just, you think that you're like a, a person that's not saved? Do you think you're the same makeup of as a person? You're not. The Bible says we're different. There's a distinction. You have people out there that are, their spirit, soul, and body, but if they're not born again, their spirit, soul, and body, but their spirits aren't born again. They're in spiritual death. There's no life in their spirit. They're not children of God. They're not born again. They're loved by God. They were brought here by God. You're different. That's why Paul got on the Corinthians when he came back after he established his church. After three years, he came back. He said, you guys are acting like mere carnal people. He said, you should be getting the meat of the word, but I got to feed you this, this milk of the word. They weren't living in the light of who they were. Does the Bible say that the natural man can't even understand or pick up the spiritual things? That's what I'm saying. That's where sometimes some people go wrong. They'll try to explain some spiritual things to people that aren't really spiritual minded. Stick to football with those people. Or talking about the rose garden. This stuff, unless the Lord leads you to, this, this is for the believer. What's Kenneth Copeland say? The believer's voice of victory. Do you have a voice? Let it be a voice of victory. Here's what Jesus said in John 3, 6. That which is born of the flesh is the flesh, and that which is born of the Holy Spirit is spirit. Amen? Amen. So if a person walks in the light of what they have, it will become obvious in the process of time. It's called spiritual growth. They'll walk in the light of it. Here's a quote from Kenneth Hagin. He said, I certainly believe in feelings. I certainly believe in feelings, but I put it last. God's word comes first, faith in God's word second, and feelings last did you get that order god's word first faith in god's word second and my feelings are last but he said too many people turn it around and put feelings first faith in their feelings second and the word of god last you know what that equals nothing <laughs> nothing nothing spiritual And so, as I said earlier, our physical senses have nothing to do with the Bible. Your physical feelings, your physical senses, 
Psalms 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Has it been settled? Then it's settled. So God's word is true regardless of your feelings or circumstances. Sometimes when God puts the giftings and callings in people, they have to walk that out now. When God called me to be a pastor, I had to hear him and I had to start walking in that road. That means I had to do things that, that my mind said you could never do it. God literally, had, when he told, called me to be a pastor, what he was doing was literally reorganizing my life into somebody that I was not, that I, that I, that I ran from being that type of person. Speaking in front of people, <laughs> right? Literally, I mean, he had to really, literally, like, my whole mind had to be transformed. And the only way to do it, I had to walk it out. We had to pack the house up and sell the house and get in the U-Haul. We had to go the whole way out there. We had, to do the, we had to follow what God put in our heart to do. I did. And I had a lot of self-doubt out there, lots of self-doubt. And then um, fear. The devil doesn't like it when you're following the will of God. And I would start get. I, I never really had like panic type things, but it was starting to just some, it was a different element. You know, I'm out there, single parent, four children. You know, my kids are in school. I'm uprooted from the family and out there trying to do things that in my natural and my physical, it's very, very hard for me to do. And he, he saw an opportunity. He tried to put that fear in me. But thank God for the Holy Ghost. Because I would lay on my apartment floor and I would pray in the spirit to that thing lifted off of me. Sometimes it would take 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half hour. I would pray in the spirit. I mean to tell you, I would just, just pray. What else is there? That's what I'm saying. It's not always like just the road doesn't just fall out there and, and you just walk through it like you're walking picking roses through a trail or something now you gotta you gotta get in it you gotta go through the emotions you gotta go through the fear if someone's told they're gonna die there's gonna be fear there you gotta say to yourself a hundred times a day i have not been given a spirit of fear but the spirit of power love and a sound mind you gotta say what god says and I, I would pray in the spirit, and I would get up on my feet when I felt that lift, and I would just start shouting the word of God. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. I have not been given a spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby I cry, Abba, Father. You know how many times I said those two verses? And I would, I mean, I would shout it, but it was okay because the, the, the neighbors upstairs, I was on the bottom floor, they were deaf. Literally, literally deaf. They couldn't hear. So I was just like, ah. Now people walking by might have heard me. And then when it seemed like I was at my lowest point, the Holy Spirit would always speak to me. One Sunday night, I was just at home, you know, I was just going to relax. I ushered on Wednesday nights. For two years, I did that. It wasn't my idea. I did it because God asked me to do it. And I felt like, I would have felt like a loser if I didn't listen to him after he got me the whole way there. <laughs> I would have felt pretty bad. And so I wasn't going to disappoint him. But one night he said, I want you to go to church. I'm like, oh man, I don't really feel like it. And he said, yeah, go. So I went and I was sitting there and um, there was a preacher named Billy Joe Watts preaching. I remember like it was yesterday. And um, He's preaching this awesome message, but then he stops it right in the middle of his message, and he comes over to my section, and he looks right down where, I, he didn't know it was me, but he knew he was in the right section. And he had a word from the Lord. And he said, the Lord told me to tell you that, that you allowed your mind to be dominated by thoughts. And now you're in a rut in these thoughts, and you have to get out of those, you have to get out of it. You have to start speaking my word again. I mean, it was to that extent, he was just, he was reading my mail to me. If you go to church hurting and looking for answers, you'll get it every time. You'll get it in the house of the Lord. You'll get the word. Amen? Because God knows. God's the one that searches the earth looking for hearts that are calling out to him. But if you don't come, if you don't put yourself in the position, you're, you're going to, you, 
you, you, that's why church, that's why it's important to get together. And I just started, you know, just pounding away at it, started getting hit in the books. And I came home between the first and second year, and I know the Lord called me to do this. I stayed with mom and dad, and, and um, dad said, you can preach Sunday. I said, all right. I was up all night. I only had like two sermons under my belt. In my first two, I was just like, I didn't know what I was doing. I just get up there because it was something new. And, and I mean, I was like flying, riding a wave of this newness. And now, man, these thoughts bombarded me. See, the, the sooner you don't make it about you, the better you'll be. And it's like, you just spent a year at Rama, and you're going to go up there, and everybody's going to think you're so terrible. And what do you do, waste a whole year at Rama, And, you know, or made it way much about me. Here it is like 3.30, 4.30 in the morning, and I, I couldn't sleep. But there wasn't no way I wasn't going to get up there the next morning. No way. I said, I'm getting up there. I don't care if I don't get no sleep, because I am not letting the devil hold that over my head. If I bail out, if I, if I, I'll get up there, and if I only say five words and fall asleep, because I didn't get no sleep, I don't know. I'm getting up there. That's the realness of it all. That's that example of, of the tree work that I'm talking about. In this world, the chippers were going off <laughs> and the wood was splattering everywhere. And there was all kinds of stuff. And then I realized it's not about me. All I gotta do is study and keep a good heart and be sincere in my heart and God does the rest. Amen. He feeds me, I feed you. Right? I'm the pastor of the church, but I'm not everybody's pastor. They have to give me that place. Right? You have to give a pastor the place in your heart, or an honor. And some people will, some people won't. But, what's, but is that, that's what they do with their life is on them. I just do what God called me to do. And that's what you do. One day I was preaching, and, I, and I, right in the middle of my sermon, I got better at it, got more comfortable. Dad always says it's like when you drill for water, you know, when the water comes up, it's muddy in the beginning. But then the more the water comes out, the clearer it gets. And I was starting to get cleared out. I had to believe the guy called me to do it because I never wanted to do it. Never had the desire to stand in front of people and never had the desire for any titles or anything. And, uh, but, uh, but I just, kept, I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And one day I'm preaching, and I'm like, Lord, I think about half the people aren't listening to me. When you're up here, you can see everything. You guys are all good, by the way. You're doing good. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's like, it's like time slows down up here. You can literally see, like, everything, and you can still preach. I, I don't know if it's part of the anointing or what. I'm like, I don't think, I think half the people aren't listening to me. And you know what he said? That's okay, preach to the half that are. <laughs> like, all right, I'll preach to the half that are. Oh, the devil can send people around with discouraging words too. When my mom was in the hospital and they said it wasn't, gonna, it wasn't looking good, I think there was like three people that came in they didn't mean anything by it, but they came in and told her how they knew somebody that died of the same thing. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> you're going to be different if you're going to walk by faith and not feelings. You're just going to be different. I think that's what the Bible means when it says you're peculiar people. I don't think it means that you're strange that you eat your lunch at, standing on your head or something. That'd be hard, wouldn't it? What's that? <laughs> standing in the corner of your head. Or it means you're going to be different. We are to see what's happening in this world different than what the world does. You better see it different than the world because Jesus said in these last days, men's hearts will fail them for fear. You better see it with the eyes of faith. You better know that some of these things are going to happen. But guess what? Our redemption draweth nigh. 
The Lord is coming back for his church. And we just got to hold ground and do what he said. Not, a, not just hold ground, we got to gain ground. So here's the formula for faith. Have God's word for whatever you may be seeking. So when you pray, pray with the word for whatever it is that you're seeking. That scripture that we just read there in 1 John 14 and 15, that could be a good scripture that you take into prayer with you. You, you can say, God, if you, if you said, if I pray anything according to your will, well, Lord, I know that this is according to your will. I know that you hear me. You said I could have it, so I thank you for it. But you got to have the word when you go to prayer. You just don't go in there trying to manipulate God or twist his arm or, or try to whatever. God felt sorry for us and he sent Jesus. Amen. Now it's up to us to respond to that wonderful gift. We respond in faith. So you got to have God's word for whatever you're seeking. And then number two, believe God's word. Number three, refuse to consider contradictory circumstances or what your physical senses tell you about it. And number four, give praise to God for the answer. The world, if they're watching a football game and their team scores a touchdown, they celebrate. Woohoo! Football's coming up again, by the way. But we're not, we're to celebrate when we pray. We're to thank God for the answer. Your prayer is a prayer request once. Then it turns into a praise report and a, and a thanksgiving and a declaration. So if you follow these steps, you'll get results. You'll receive deliverance, healing, answered prayer, whatever you may be seeking from the Lord. And then I want to finish out with this. I've got four minutes. This is always the pastor side of me that brings this, these types of things in. When the devil realizes that he no longer can stop you, when he realizes you're on to the word now, you're on to what God said, you know who you are in Christ, and you're going to move out. When he realizes he can't stop you anymore, he's going to try to push you. Where's he going to push you? He's going to push you into pride. That's his next move. When he can't stop you anymore, and you know who you are, and you, and you know what the word says, he's going to try to push you into pride. Doesn't Timothy 3, 6 don't put a nov say, don't put a novice in office, lest they be lifted up in pride and fall into the same condemnation of the devil? Pride means to be conceited or high-minded. So here's what we do. We have to stay in love. The eternal flame of love. We have to stay in honor. We have to stay in obedience to the word. And serve God with the heart of, of gratitude. Amen? And, and, and humility. Because just because you come into the house of God and, and you're doing good doesn't mean the devil says, okay, let's go home and, and let's leave them alone. The old nature will always try to come out. It just comes out in different ways. Maybe you got to knock the stuff of the world out, but then it's going to try to come in different ways. So that means you can't get offended. Or if you do, you got to get it right. That means you don't repay evil for evil. That means you got to guard your heart. That means when people in the world try to come in and knock you out of your love walk, you got to remember that love never fails or love never ceases. It's an eternal flame, and you are burning with that love forever. Because you will win battles if, as long as you stay in the Spirit. You stay humble, you'll win battles. If you, if you start getting in the flesh, you're going to start losing battles. You're going to start losing ground. And the Bible says we got to guard our heart. Amen? And so it's, it's like Paul said, it's not I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. When we come to that place and we know what we know, there's nothing the devil can do. 
you can really, really see all these prayer answers to your prayer. You, all you got to do is pray and believe. That's all I have. Would you rise, please? Thank you for coming out tonight. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for this uh, opportunity that we have. Thank you, Lord God, for uh, being here with us. Thank you, Father God, for um, allowing us, Lord God, and gifting us the ability to walk in your spirit, Lord. So, Lord, I thank you for being with each and every person that's here. I thank you, Lord God, for ministering to their hearts. I thank you for prosperity. I thank you for healing in their life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.